Hi everybody, my name is Joseph Mayo and I'm here at TPC Summerlin in Las Vegas, Nevada where I'm the Director of Instruction. And in this video we're going to talk about two very important and unique topics. The first one is the 3D hand path, the three-dimensional hand path. And the second is the lead wrist, which for a right-handed golfer is the left wrist. We're going to talk about how it should move and how it actually wants to move. And before I get started, I want to make it clear that I am not a biomechanist, nor am I a PhD scientist. I want to make that clear. But I've had the pleasure to learn from many of those guys, very intelligent people, and I want to share with you the information that I have learned with them so we can all get better. And just some of the names off the top of my head, Dr. Mike Duffy, uh, Dr. Sasho McKenzie, Dr. Young Hu Kwan, Dr. Stephen Nesbitt, uh, smart guys, uh, unbelievably smart. And, and that list that I just gave you is not nearly all inclusive. Uh, also, Dr. Phil Cheatham, uh, that, that list is not all inclusive. I could stand here for 45 minutes and just read off names that I've learned from, but uh, we wouldn't get the video filmed. So anyway, um, let's start off with 3D hand path. If you watch a really good golf swing, in the downswing, when the hands get to about the right thigh, some very interesting things occur. The hand path, the handle of the golf club, actually begins to move up. It does not continue moving down. And from this view, the hands, as I said, move up, but they also move in and around. In, up, and around. Now think about this. Once again, downswing to about the right thigh. In this position, the ball is going to be somewhere up here. My hands are back here, and the club head is way back there. Not even close to impact. The club head is as far away from the ball almost as it's going to be. And yet, the hands start moving up. And a lot of people still believe that the lowest point of the hands is impact or the divot. Not true. Low point happens way back here, way before impact. Now, I'm not telling you that you should hit up on your five iron. I'm telling you that the hands are moving up during impact while the sweet spot is moving down. Now, knowing that the hands move up and in, that, that's, that's, a broad, that, that's a broad statement, and it has far-reaching implications, and this is why. Let's examine what makes the hand path rise and move up and in. Well, once again, here at the right thigh, then the legs begin to push and straighten. The pelvis begins to rise and thrust, and the left shoulder begins to open up and around in good golf swings. And all of those movements together make the hand path rise and turn the corner. Now think about this guys. If we know that the hands are moving up well before impact in good golf swings, why are people told every day on the driving range to hit down? That is a great question that has baffled me for a long time. And I can tell you right now, if someone told me to hit down or pull down or stay down, I can tell you this, I wouldn't straighten my legs, I wouldn't thrust my pelvis, and I surely wouldn't open up my left shoulder. I wouldn't do any of those things, which means by definition that my pivot is being ruined. And when you ruin the pivot, then you have to severely uh, interfere with the 3D hand path. And when you interfere with that, then you interfere with the 3D sweet spot path. And I can tell you right now, the travel of this sweet spot through impact, three-dimensionally, is the sole determinant of how good of a golfer you are and will become, period. And what controls the 3D sweet spot path? We do. And we have one attachment, our hands. So that stands to reason that the hand path controls the sweet spot path. And that's why I've said many times before 
that the most important motion in the body is the 3D hand path. And the quality of that hand path will determine the quality of your golf game without question. So just to reiterate, once the hands get to about the right thigh, they're moving up, in, and around. Now we're going to key on that a little bit later, so just keep that in mind. Now let's talk about the lead wrist. And I'm going to get a little closer to the camera. And as you can see, I've got a flat left wrist. This motion would be flexion. Some people call it palm reflection. This motion would be called extension. Alright, so we've got flexion and we have extension. And what I have learned from these really, really smart scientists that I just mentioned is that in good golf swings, what we would like to see when the downstroke begins, we would like to see that lead wrist move into some amount of flexion. We would like to see that. It doesn't always happen, and some players absolutely do not do that. But we would like to see the left wrist move into flexion some amount when the downstroke begins. Some players are in flexion uh, at the top. But anyway, when the downstroke begins, we would like to see that left wrist move into flexion. And here's the interesting part, guys. It then, once it gets to about the right thigh, more or less, it goes from a position of flexion and it moves toward extension. It should not go flexion and then hang on. It should not do that. But I can tell you right now, there are many, many players out there right now that are doing just that. And some of them play great golf. Not saying that they don't. But once again, we want to move from flexion toward and into extension. And, and I know that we've all heard of the nice flat left wrist at impact. And you're probably thinking, Joe, teaching someone to do that, well, that's terrible. That, that's flipping the club. No, it's not. I've got photographs of Greg Norman, Jack Nicklaus, Tiger Woods, Adam Scott, Roy McElroy with a driver. And I think we can agree these are Hall of Fame type players that hit it high and far. And every single one of those pictures, after impact, that lead wrist is extended. It is not flat, arched this way. It goes from here. Bam! To extension. That's what the wrist wants to do. That's what it needs to do. And it's no coincidence that the guys that bomb this thing high and far are doing exactly that. Now, I would say, and this is a guesstimate, I would say that probably 80%, maybe even more, of the PGA Tour at the top of their backstroke probably have some cup in the wrist which means they're in some level of extension. And I think most of us, when we grip the golf club, we have a little turn of our hand. Not many people gripping it like this. We have a little bit of a turn. And usually that's going to put that wrist into some level of extension at the top of your backswing. I agree with that wholeheartedly. But what I'm saying is this. What we want to do is if we are in a little extension, when we start down, we want to get that wrist to flex a little bit. Some do it more than others, and as I said, some don't do it at all, but we want to get that wrist to flex and then work toward and into extension. Now, I know what you're thinking. Once again, you've got a high handicapper who uh, looks like this on camera, and you're thinking, Joe, the, the, the wrist angles are terrible. Well, yes and no. Uh, it's not necessarily that the position that the wrist is in is terrible, it's when that position occurred. Because I can tell you right now, this extension, Jack Nicklaus was in extension, but he was in extension over here. The 25 handicapper is in extension back here. This look is not the problem, it's a symptom of the problem. And the problem is a faulty pivot. You need to teach the student how to use the ground how to open up, how to be more dynamic, but that's another topic for another video. I'm just letting you understand what the wrist angles should do 
and what they want to do. Now, remember when I told you a few minutes ago about the hitting down, how it was going to tie together? Well, this is how it does. Now, let's think about something. Let's say we're swinging a driver 110 miles an hour like a PJ Tour player. But yet, we're trying to keep that wrist flat through impact and past impact. So let's think about this. That club head has a tremendous amount of energy. There's a lot of force. There's a lot of speed. And I think we can all agree that energy, that club head, that sweet spot wants to go up and around our body. That's where it wants to go. So any attempt to retard that or to hamper that, it cannot be good. So if I'm hitting a golf shot toward the camera, driver 110 miles an hour, and I know the sweet spot wants to go up and around, well, let's look at this. If I'm holding on to that wrist and trying to maintain the flatness, look at that motion versus this motion. I have a little bit of flex, and then watch this. I go up and around, and that wrist gets into extension. So the idea of the wrist extending goes hand in hand with good old fashioned common sense that all of the force and all of the speed and the sweet spot, it wants to go up and around our body. It wants to do that and letting the wrist extend accommodates it. It goes hand in hand with it instead of trying to stay down, pull down and hold on and try to lock that wrist into some condition. When you think of it in those terms, it makes a lot of sense. Now, there are a couple of my colleagues who have made some really, really great videos on what we're talking about now. Uh, Brian Manzella, a good friend of mine, he's a top 100 teacher out of New Orleans. He said, uh, imagine when you're 15 years old and you get fresh with a girl and she wants to give you a smack. How is she going to do it? Well, she's going to load her wrist. She's going to flex it. Pow, and then she gives you a good smack. From this view, load the wrist, give it a good smack. Uh, Chris Como, another top 100 teacher out of Dallas, Texas, he did a video a little over a year ago, if I remember, and he had a great analogy. He said, when you start your downstroke, make the palm face you, and then through impact, try to get the back of the hand to face you. Uh, and Grant Waite, a, a guy that I had the pleasure of teaching with on the PJ Tour for three seasons, I know that Grant is using this with a couple of his PJ Tour students having phenomenal success. Uh, and I know right now I've got two PJ Tour players doing this uh, uh, as we speak, and their ball striking has improved. They're hitting the ball really high, really far, instead of low and crooked. And, and I realize that, that, that talking about going from here to here is going to sound like Chinese to a lot of people because we've always viewed this as bad. We've always viewed this as the hallmark of the bad golfer. It's not the extension that's the bad part, it's when the extension occurs. And that's a pivot issue, that's a sequencing issue, and that's another video. Now I want to touch on one other subject here. Um, I've had the pleasure and the privilege of many, many great players coming to me for help with their golf swing. And there is an epidemic on the PGA Tour, and it is hurting players, and it has, it has ruined careers. It has derailed some great players. And it comes from this. From the top of the backswing, we see the handle of the golf club go straight down. It gets pulled down. And when that happens, that lead wrist is going to extend. That's just the way that it is. They go hand in hand like cousins. Shaft goes down, wrist extends, and oftentimes you'll see the elbows kind of get further apart. This is such a major, major problem because remember what I said. We want to go from flex to extend, not extend to then trying to flex. And there are great players guys who can beat me by 20 shots, no question about it, who are going from extension to flexion. And they've been told to do that. And 
the data and the science tells us that it's absolutely backwards. We want to go from a position of flexion and work toward extension, not the other way around. Now let's touch on how that can be so damaging. The next time you go to the range, take your six iron. I've got my brand new Callaway six iron right here. Lay some balls on the ground and make a back stroke about three quarters, just like this. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to take that left wrist and just cup it. I want you to extend it. You see that shaft stand up? And from here, chip some balls out there you're going to find out real quickly that it's hard to do. You're going to hit them low and they're going to cut. They're going to kind of skank out there to the right. It's not going to be fun at all. Then make the same backstroke and flex that wrist. You notice how that shaft laid down. It settled down. Now I'm not saying that you have to lay the shaft down to be a great player. There's Hall of Famers that actually stood the shaft up. But I would much rather play golf from here than from here. I think this is a really, really good place to be. Uh, and we can film a video on why this is a really good place to be. But anyway, go to the top here, flex that wrist, let that shaft lay down, and chip some balls out there. You're going to automatically, your athletic instinct is going to tell you, wow, this is easier. I can feel the hand path move up and through the ball, you're going to hit these nice little draws out there. Whereas from here, extended, your angle of attack is going to feel steep, it's going to feel choppy, the ball flight's going to be low and slicing and cutting. It's not a good spot to be in. <clears throat> and for you instructors and you good players, if you're having trouble with this wrist, you might be push cutting your driver starting the ball to the right and cutting even more. Now watch this. If you have a driver and you come down like this and you've got that wrist extended way deep like this, now something's got to give. If we want to draw this ball, we know the face has to be slightly to the right of the target and the path has to be further to the right. But when you're in this position with a steep shaft and that wrist extended, the only way you can do it is try to maybe tilt back. See when I tilt back how that kind of lowers the shaft a little? Then you're going to have to raise the handle. The problem with that is, is the face lays back. It points to the right. And because that wrist is in such a bad spot, you can't get the path right of the face. And there goes the push cut. So uh, if, you're in, if you're one of those people who pull the handle down and extend the wrist, and your instructor says, well, you just got to swing to the right. It's not going to work because to swing to the right, I got to do this. There goes the push cut and you'll push cut it until you're blue in the face or then you'll start pull hooking it because the shaft is steep over to the left. So that's just something to think about for you really good players. Now, lastly, every month in the leading golf instructional magazines and articles, we have the article on how to stop slicing. And it seems like for the last 50 years, the default article is strengthen the grip, rotate the face. And we all know that it probably doesn't work because if it did, then we wouldn't have 20 million slicers out there. Let's examine the advice of strengthening the grip and rotating the face. Let's examine it. When you strengthen that grip, do you see what you've done? You've extended the wrist a lot. And I just got done telling you how if that wrist is really extended, it is really easy to cut the ball. It's really easy to be steep. It's really easy to have bad contact. And I can tell you right now, there are some tour players who are in a lot of extension here, but they get back into flexion and then let it go. World-class athletes who have impeccable timing who hit a thousand balls a day. You're not going to find the 15 handicap member who's gonna roll that hand over, get that wrist up here like this, and then have the ability to go here and here. It's not gonna happen. So first of all, the advice of strengthening the grip, it serves to extend the wrist even more. We already know that's a major problem, major problem. Now think about this. If you know the ball flight laws, 
you know that to draw the ball, the ball has to start to the right of the target. And the ball starts basically where the face is pointed, so that means the face has got to be right of the target. Well, a strong grip leads to the face being left of the target. I'm not saying always. Zach Johnson has a strong grip. He draws every ball beautifully. I'm saying the preponderance of people, when they roll that grip over, any forearm rotation is going to point that face left of the flag. And when that happens, the ball starts left of the flag. And by definition, if you're going to hit it back to the hole, the ball has to cut. If it starts left and it draws, you're in trouble. So now, one more time, when you roll that grip over to strengthen it, you extend the wrist. That's strike one. And a strong grip usually leads to the ball starting to the left. And that's strike two. And I don't want to see strike three. So, you know, I, I had a really, really good player not long ago, uh, a couple weeks ago, come to me. Really strong grip, wrist was extended, push cutting his driver. I had him weaken his grip to where the thumb was straight down the shaft. And he was sweating BBs because he thought, oh my God, the face is now going to be wide open. I'll hit it 80 yards dead right. But I did this, and I had him do this. And he is bombing these beautiful high draws because now when the grip is not so turned, it's easier to get it into some amount of flexion. And the last thing, when that left wrist goes into a flexed position, it settles the shaft, and watch this. As I turn through, you see how the shaft is slightly inside the hands? That is a great place to be to draw the ball. Versus pulling it down, extended, the shaft is outside the hands, and that's a great place to be if you want to flub it, shank it, top it, hit steep. That's not good golf. So that's another really uh, valuable point to learn about flexing the wrist and then working toward extension. Guys, I hope that I've helped you. I hope that this has answered some questions. Um, use it for your own game. Use it on your lesson tee. Um, and I enjoyed making these videos. I love doing it. I hope you got something out of it. And I will have another one for you really soon.